Um, so first of all, like I would like to thank the ICA for uh, inviting me to uh, have this talk with Uri, that is an artist that I deeply admire. Um, if some of you in the audience like didn't have the chance to visit the current show that opened just last night at City Colds in Kingley Street, I would really recommend you to do that because it's a beautiful show, very intense, very rich, very structured, very dense, and um, it's really like a show that you can spend hours in it because it's, there's so many works and like each work has so many layers and so many hidden things. You really like, uh, I was yesterday at the opening, then we came back this morning. It's really like an experience. So like, I'm mean, really happy that to have this chance to talk with Uri um, about this show. And I would just maybe like start straight away uh, talking about it. So the show is, you know, like it's titled uh, Two Things About Suffering. And it takes this title from um, a video piece that is in the show that it was, I believe, commissioned by the Walker <coughs> Center in Minneapolis. Um, you see like some of the images of uh, one of the videos, the central piece um, here. And so like the, in the video you see these two men, one is the twin brother of Uri, um, he's a jazz musician, and these two men, they act, they perform in this kind of environment that makes you think of some sort of industrial archaeological site. They do a number of things. They, some of this, some of, sometimes like they do, not, I wouldn't say strange things, but they act in a way that it seems natural sometimes, and then other moments it doesn't seem that natural. Um, and from this piece, other video pieces that are in the show were originated. Um, so the script of this piece comes from a number of sources. One source is this book that was wrote in the 30s about uh, method acting, is a book, uh, I have to read it because like the name is really hard for me, is Richard Bolis Glansky, like, yes, <laughs> who uh, wrote in 1993 acting the first six lessons, which is a book that Uri was reading and making margin notes and so the two things, parts of, excerpt, uh, parts of the books and some of the notes that Rudy wrote himself, they blend together in what is the script of, of, the, of the video. So I don't know, maybe we can start from the story that is behind the video and the, 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 the other incarnations that you have displayed in the show as what we call chapters, which are installed um, in sort of workstations on screen, so you can navigate the show and see this number of chapters of the video. So like, um, um, yeah, I think it's interesting because I think it's a work that really like tells a lot about your practice, about like this um, re reflection about acting, staging, performance, filming, editing and um, more spontaneous acts that can happen through this process. Yeah, I think maybe um, sort of a revealing fact about it or something that um, spreads out into the other work and can serve as a key, um, if you will, it's basically how um, my process in terms of interest and my problems encountering a specific text or ideas, my personal relationship to it, um, on a personal level and a political level as well, or social level, um, are a starting point. So something like a text, uh, which is this, not objective text, but something external to my practice to begin with, becomes something that I have a personal relationship to, and my mark making on it, in terms of language and in terms of visual language, becomes something that's useful in turn for something else. Um, and then the manipulation stage begins, uh, if you will. So something that I don't necessarily plan on having as a final product becomes um, a document or a starting point for a finalized piece. So like you're saying, I read this book and I found it very interesting. 
Um, I must say I was a bit cynical about this whole idea, you know, of uh, method acting and uh, while I was working on a performance and trying to create a situation of uh, resolving uh, dynamics within a group of people that I was working from stage A to stage B, which is the performance and the rehearsals and see what's going on within that group. So I was um, trying to read about method acting and specifically with this book I found some problems, maybe like some social or maybe something that has to do with the time that this book was written. Um, so I started marking things in it. Some of it was, and you know, the final product, if I jump a bit uh, forward in terms of the script, um, like many things um, in other mediums that have to do with these different kinds of learning, sometimes work in concert or Discord. So at some point I just decided this will be the text for um, um, the actors, um, which are not really professional actors and musicians. But you said that they're acting there, and I would say that they're acting, and they're also acting out. Mm. Um, and in that se sense, I use manipulation, both in terms of what um, I do to the text, what I do with the video, um, in the editing, but also how I manipulate them in a way. Um, I let them act out, or I let them act until they act out. And I try to catch that and work with that as source material. Yeah, because this is something that often happens, especially in your video works. So you have, so for example, this book is about like acting, so instructions, to how to perform. And uh, if I understand well, uh, the person, the author of the book was really involved in the method acting, which is this methodology to uh, perform in a very expressive way, like reaching out like some sort of like authentic experience of the stage. And in many of your works, you have, for example, moments when uh, you, the viewer is immersed in uh, um, a narration. Like, for example, you make a lot the use of music, which, you know, it's a very emotional device to uh, create some sort of atmosphere, some sort of emotion. And then immediately, like in a kind of a even more brutal way, like, for example, the, the action is interrupted by a voice that comes outside of the of the of the video that tells for example the performance what to do or there is a form of editing that interrupts the narration so there is always this play between something that is clearly staged something that looks spontaneous mm -hmm. something that looks even like some, some sort of found footage or a form of diary so i think that and this always appears in the literature that accompanies your work. There is always this play between something that is spontaneous mm -hmm. and something that is staged, something that is dictated by the conformity to rules, social rules or behaviors, and something that is supposed to be authentic or sincere as yeah. authentic. So how come that this is such a concern for you? Like, you know, like, it is sort of the main core of yeah your work. <coughs> I'm trying to take a step back maybe and, and talk about some of the ideas that you mentioned. You know, I'm really, maybe I would say believe, but also very attracted to this notion of artificiality and what I can do with it and that how come how that will come into play in the, in the work. Um, and I would say the things that I remember or try to uh, look at and also work with uh, in the work is maybe this kind of operatic relationship um, between objects, between people in the text and so on. And in that sense also with the music. How can I use music in editing or how can I use rhythm um, between characters or in situation and in architecture or choreography um, to define social situations. In that sense, as for example, taking things outside my practice, um, classical music or opera, operatic relationships um, that basically have to do with moral and uh, social definitions that are presented by music or presentation. I mean, it can happen, you know, from like um, social conventions, you know, if a Mozart piece begins with three notes, which has to do with something political more, uh, to uh, Peter and the Wolf, right? That different um, um, uh, characters are defined. Uh, we have uh, some sort of, uh, there's an affect um, uh, to them that defines them morally in terms of um, the good, the bad, the scary, the sort of naive and so on. Um, other examples would be from different genres. It would be uh, westerns, or specifically maybe spaghetti westerns. You know, like the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. You know, like different characters that actually literally have the definition of good and bad come with a specific um, few notes or melody that defines them. Um, and uh, 
specifically with that, maybe the, um, with the working with the Ennio Morricone, you know, like the, 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 um, the, the, those westerns were basically written or scripted to music, right? So it's never clear what started first, and I tried to do that. Um, to work in that sense. It's almost like Star Wars, you know, in that sense. There's the good and there's the bad, and they come with the music and the costume, right? So I don't do it uh, so uh, literally in that way, but, but I think about it. And um, working with musicians um, and with music, some of which is music that we worked on together or them separately or um, ready-made, um, allow me to uh, work with people who are A, sensitive to it, and can react to it, and B, I can manipulate or like push it in towards like different characters by defining what they can and cannot do, who can speak, who cannot speak, uh, what's the parameters in terms of uh, the architecture that they can operate in, um, how they respond to, uh, to one another, and also give them very, very either super specific or more abstract but specific but, but super simplified, like, you know, not bad guy and good guy, but like, you know, you react angry or sad or happy, and in that sense connecting it into like a drama class, you know, but really refining it, you know, sometimes I look at my work, at the performance work, and I really think about like end of the year drama class, you know, performance for like six writers, you know, but what happens when you take that paradigm and apply it on grown-ups, if you will, Yeah. you know, that come with, you know, this sort of affectation and like what they represent and their histories, their facial histories, their gestures and so on. So a lot of uh, the videos are also based on, you know, like catching those gestures and like making almost a registry or an archive of gestures. You know, try and trying to like in working with those guys over years at this point, what do I know that they can give me? How do I pull and push those little things and adjust them to like what I want? Um, continuing, if, if if I'm not too out right now, which happens sometimes, um, but I think what you asked also is this notion of like being in the video and outside the video, yeah. and that has to do with music as well and other forms of manipulation and suspension of disbelief. Mm -hmm. So I spoke about different genres. I think the notion of genres is what's really important for me, both in the time-based work and in general, you know, in grouping things. Um, um, using a specific dynamics that represent, or like even costumes or relationships or transactions between, in, between uh, people and music as well, that uh, brings forth different genres. And again, just refining this notion of genres through those things. There's something noir about it, there's something that could be like a bit too, like Western about it, uh, slapsticky and so on, different things, you know? Um, because, for example, before we were talking about the fact that the both, both the characters in the different chapters are jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. So jazz has to do with the jamming and improvisation on the one hand, but you were also mentioning the fact that they live in also in some sort of conventional imaginary, like, you know, living at night. There is a romanticism connected with being a jazz musician living at night, kind of you know, having this more romantic way of writing or getting drunk. I mean, like, a, this is, you find it in, in the work. I mean, sometimes you have the impression that they're, like, uh, acting. Sometimes you have the impression that they're just being themselves. Yep. And, uh, and I think that it's particularly interesting that this comes at play with, from a, a form of more sort of a structural point of view, if we, like, mm -hmm. if you want to mention this in reference to uh, lang the language of video and film, mm -hmm. but also that you brought their own way of being musicians into that, and the two things, they overlap. You see, I work with people that are very basically used to be on stage, used to improvise, and used to working in harmony, right? Um, even if it's not necessarily um, a create harmony. And um, I take them into, so it's basically shift the paradigm into what I do, and they're kind of lost in the beginning. You know, so even though it's people that are very comfortable with like being in front of a camera, or on stage, and so on, so like the opposite of what I feel comfortable uh, am in, as you might notice, but, but I try to push them, and sometimes they just, that's what I said before about acting out. You know, they were not happy, you know, in many situations. They were not happy. Maybe they were the happiest when just sit and play, when I try to capture as well, and I let them do that as well. But I decide when they do that and don't do that, and I decide when they're in comfort zone or not, and I try to push that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, b basically, it's really like, it's almost like I reduce people to, um, I don't reduce people, but with these ca characters, if you will, um, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to make a cartoon image of human emotions, not at all, you know, or sentimentality, but I do try to refine them into almost like, not stick figures, but what they are, what I define them as in the videos characters rather, 
almost cartoon characters. Again, not representing a cartoon um, situation of the politics and the social situation, but them as characters, formal elements. The same way I would use my palette um, for painting, or if I use the same uh, photographs for a collage or for a sculpture and so on, um, I would use them in different situations, different chapters. Um, in that sense, and again, I'm kind of talking about many different things. Um, there's this coming back to a child world in a way, you know, when I look at those things as chapters of those videos, I use the same characters in different situations, you know, it's almost like sequels, right, there are different situations, um, different chapters, you know, there are different books, children books about um, protagonists can be a specific animal, so, you know, there's like, you know, a chapter of like 20 books, one time is, uh, you know, we can be in the Middle East, another time in the USA, another time in Africa, and so on and so on. So I take these guys and I basically let them do different things in different places. You know, they're my palette and I bring it with me wherever I go to change the um, palette in terms of uh, topography, but using the same um, two things, you know? Yeah. And would you say, because of course, I mean, we're all aware that we live in a moment when some sort of staged identity is present in every moment of our life, you know, we stage a form of intimacy with the other people because we decide actively how to convey like our image you know through social media and everything would you say that this is something that enters your world like the way that we every day we take tropes from you know fashion world cinema tv music and we actively and so consciously especially with the younger generations this is like so clear like i mean they are so at easy in representing themselves well that would be just like them. a change a shift into the mode of representation or yeah. like acting on it but but yeah it's inevitable you know we yeah. live in this quoted world right and everything goes through language and sort of like this the problems or you know like stumbling upon language and what we can represent or not so yeah, of course, and specifically with this work that, like I said before, has this notion of different genres. You know, some of those like different videos and also in the flat work as well, you could see different things from different places in a way that may, might uh, bring to mind uh, different genres. So, yeah, absolutely, it's like quotations, and I use quotations in the text as well. I mean, yeah. it's based on quotations, quote, quoting myself, but also specifically quoting something that comes from like a place of knowledge. You know, yeah, you because you, you often say that everything is quoted. Like we were talking about the fact before that both of us, we don't have English as like our native language. So like that we have to process the information in a kind of a more conscious way when we, when we talk because it's not instinctive when we both use language. And, uh, and of course, I mean, language is I would say like a central topic in your work. Before we were um, re-watching the show together and we were noticing that um, in every piece there is language. In every singular, in every individual work, like, um, I mean, it's not clear here, but every painting has form of writings, um, every drawing has something written on it. Um, you were trained as a topographer yeah, before, the study, the design, yeah. before the study um, art. Yeah, no, in that sense, you know, there's a formal representation of language, but yeah. also in terms of the typography, in terms of form, and, um, and uh, the different materials that I use. Um, especially, you know, in the paintings and the drawings, also some of the sculptures, they're almost like a diaristic notion of the process, you know, when yeah. I write comments, I change, of course, the same thing in the videos, which are based on, uh, on, um, on text, um, but also in the sculptural work, I try to create languages, yeah. you know, so it has the typography and um, specifically, you know, the formal values, um, you know, negative and positive space, the meaning of things, um, representation and so on. Um, but also the topography of it in terms of how it's staged um, in a specific architecture. And, um, and again, um, the language, different languages within art history or different languages within the cin cinematic or film history. So, so the show has this very kind of a clear structures in terms of installation. You sort of created an architecture within the architecture through what you call the workstations, which are this enclosed space that you can use to watch the different chapters. 
and then you have a number of vitrines with objects uh, you have freestanding sculptures and many flat works on the walls being both drawings and paintings so at the first glance like yeah. the whole thing could look quite disjointed like you know mm -hmm. like what I'm supposed to look at a video a sculpture a vitrine uh, a drawing but then the more you look at it yeah. the more the things they come together um, I think that's almost like a mirror image in a way of the studio process yeah you know part of this um, um, maybe process of decision making it what is it that I do every day in the studio? How do I solve that day? Um, it has to do with like waiting and aging, you know, of the work and of me with it. And at the same time, decision making of like, where's the beginning, where's the end, you know? And in that sense, there's a time-based um, situation of different routes you can take and pick. That's one thing. The other thing is, you know, this notion that I spoke with you about before of typography and topography. I can speak um, about it both in terms of one contained piece or the room in general, you know. I mean, I've, I've been talking about it before in, 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 in other events, and um, it's, you know, almost like a closed system in terms of um, one piece, one painting, one sculpture, but also how I organize the space. Um, in terms of um, uh, the specificity or what each thing represents, and how they all work or don't work together, like in the choreography of the space, or the composition of the space, I'm sorry. Um, and I think, in that sense, it's both formal, you know, it's like a flattened representation of things and meanings, but also it has something to do with the social situation. We talked about it before, you know, some of those pieces look like almost, to me, like maps or directions, you know, and one example that I gave before, or I gave it a couple of times, you know, like, is you and I basically talking and, or sitting in a restaurant, for instance, and you would ask me how to get somewhere. <coughs> and I would use what I have in front of me to show you, to represent what is what. For instance, you know, this is you, this is me, and this is a square we're trying to get to, or the gallery, and I would move things around to show you how to get there. When I do that, there's the social situation and the projection into a formal, um, sort of flattened um, and reduced um, surface that stays as a representation, as mark makings of our conversation, but creates a composition at the same time. And I find it uh, super elementary or s simple, but magical, you know, and, um, and full of other, I mean, it's abject, but it has humor as well. Yeah. But there are like lots of similarities between the way that you use, for example, the footage and the editing in the video works, yeah. and the way they use the marks and the stains and the traces in the, the, the paintings or the drawings, because both the things they, it has to do a lot with layers, mm -hmm. with like um, a sort of like um, condensation of memories. Like, you know, the drawings and uh, the paintings, they're never like really simple. They have a lot of layers, a lot of things that may have happened in different moments of time and that they come together. The same way that in the videos you have the impression that many sources, they come together, many different moments of memory, they come together. Uh, so I think that this is a more kind of a structural form of bridging the gap between more static works and moving image. Yeah. Like, but also, uh, the thing is that if the video work has a lot to do with this, what you say, like suspending the disbelief, so breaking the rules of fiction and pointing out that what you're watching is some sort of conventional staged performance. Yeah, breaking the suspension of this belief. Yes. Yeah. In a way, like something, I would say, not similar, but like something analog happens in the drawings because there Maybe are... Maybe the notion of the making of. Yes, right? exactly. So not really, again, not making a caricature of it, you know, like, you know, bloopers, but 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 making sure that the, this idea of, of artificiality is present, uh, is present and aware. Not as, I mean, it's not like a sort of like a political position against any other, any other kind of, 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 of work methodology. But in my case, almost a thought process of you know disbelief, disbelief, and getting the confidence back in terms of what I do is evident in the work I believe because of revisiting the work over and over again and using this diaristic. Um, maybe way of working, you know, maybe commenting on the work and leaving a mark of the comments. And at some point it becomes a strategy, I would say. Yeah. Because instead of just saying like, you know, oh, 
writing quote or understand or even writing what is it that I want to do, you know, add blue, add red directions in the studio, I would use that where I want it. Um, I would I would use it typographically. I would write something, but I won't necessarily make it legible. I just know I need a word here or there. Yeah. You know, and the projection into it in terms of what this might mean. Um, this uh, gives a diaristic notion rather than an actual registry of what happened, right? So it gives a notion of the studio, it gives a notion of, 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 of a history, but I use it to um, basically inject history into the work or the notion of history without it really re referencing something specific. Yeah. Because the work, I mean, like, uh, it has this... You see what I mean? I, I'm sorry to interrupt, yeah, yeah, but, no, no. but maybe to connecting, and again, you know, I'm, I'm a bit... I know I'm making a lot of sort of disjoints between, like, different questions, but... But what I said before about the table and organization and the mark making in language in the videos, but specifically also in the sculptures and the painting, that in a way you know can slip back into a sculpture or go back up in the one of the painting, is something that you know you see from a very early, early age. You know, and that's another example that I use. You know, like like um, education and school desks. You know, one of the first things you do in school, or like one would do, at least from my experience, is organize your environment, right? And that's something that's an artist, or I would believe, I believe anyone in an office, as a student, everywhere, basically, even sometimes in the bus, but definitely on a sort of a board of concentration. Yeah. When time is passing, you organize your space. So, you know, strong memories that I have, or things that I see now, which I found pretty amazing, is, is, is a classroom, and how kids divide their space. You know, you would see, you would enter a classroom, or I remember that, you know, from my classroom, how some kids had a collection of photographs, but more basic, how people, like, first of all, divide the space between them. You know, that's my territory, that's your territory, you know, and in a way it relates to the video in some ways because, you know, somebody told you to be here, you're going to sit here for 12 years and you're going to learn, so start developing your own vocabulary now. And f I'm sure every kid has a different, some people have a very neat table, you know, which I could never really understand, and maybe that's why I sort of slipped from design into uh, what I do now, which I actually find very influenced from design all the time, you know, but I'm really attracted to this notion of, um, um, mark making on a table, you know, some people are very organized and they can like write notes in terms of how to cheat in a test Other people can basically, you know, write good or th bad things about friends or other people Other people, like I said, like, you know, you don't move through this point And other people take it to the next step of sculpture, you know, like they take a pencil or, you know, like other sharp tools And then make, you know, tunnels from one end to the other end of the table And, you know, they end up with this like almost beautiful or really violent um, um, statue you know, that's, that's, that's almost like, um, yeah, it's like, it's like an album, you know, it's an archive of, of can be like, you know, a day in school or like, or a lifetime, so, there is, uh, being a bit... Uh, no, a bit uh, it's interesting because, like, there is this dimension of childhood in your work. Yeah. There is a, yeah. you've done, like, for example, I remember that uh, the, the video work that you were showing at the South London Gallery had mm -hmm. this found footage of a recital with kids or... Yeah, end of the year dance performance. Exactly. Yeah. And the, 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 the person who was acting in the video was talking about like growing up from a child to a teenager yep. to like a mature human being. Yep. Um, there is often this idea of childhood in your... How come? I mean... Well, specifically with that video, you know, there's this guy that's basically talking about sort of like basic Freudian notions of like, you know, from age this to this, this happens, so that, but instead of actually using um, uh, textbooks for that, I, we basically invented materials together. Now he has a very sort of, um, I would say, a voice of authority with a specific accent from a specific place that, you know, some of us might recognize coming from a specific background, right? So I'm trying to use those things the same way I'm using them um, and the sounds, and the, I sort of push forward. You'll see if you see the videos, you know, like I separate channels. So you can, and I show the the lavaliers, the neck mics. Um, so the different uh, formal elements that come from film um, are being pushed, um, almost as a quotation of that. At the same time, like you said before, like you know, pulling in and out of suspension of disbelief, uh, you're in it. So, um, and I was saying that because. In that video, I used him, you know, like as, um, not in a too, maybe like, obvious way, but authority of knowledge, right? Because he has the voice of knowledge, almost the voice of a documentary, right? Which is, of course, the voice of knowledge. And that comes, you know, like with the male voice in that case, specific accent, sort of like things like you sort of like inhale, but if you think about it, you know, it's something that, again, was pushed on us, right? 
Um, in the same time, with juxtapose, with uh, something that could be either charming or, or, or maybe a bit abject, you know, but it's like end of the year performance, which I found, you know, very sentimental in a good way, you know, and, and, and beautiful. But there was, you know, the notion of memory and how you orchestrate that um, into a film language or a video language. And of course, video is really important to me. V with a capital V, you know, it has the, it had, these were like, you know, big VHS tapes, the, what I used there, and it has the language of video. So juxtaposing that with the HD, foot, um, HD footage um, gave a sort of like, it's not, I'm not that interested in terms of even like the high and the low, but in terms of time, shifting time, and uh, using that or using the manipulation of that with that voiceover um, in time based language. Well, to also has to do a Exist, lot existing modes of representation in that sense that, that, that I quote, that I bring it to that. But they don't necessarily use them in the same way. I basically accentuate the manipulation rather than the narrative. You know, I talk about the beginning, middle and the end, but I don't necessarily use them as beginning, middle and end. It's like the paintings or the drawings. Many times it would look like something that's taken, that's a connection many times with the video. It looks like it's taken from a storyboard, but it won't have, you know, it won't have the walk the banana on the floor, then the slip, and then the fall. Yeah. It might be one of them taken out and placed and, and framed separately, right? So you would say that collage and assemblage are the main operations between your work in terms of both the way they use the appropriated images, the editing, the... Maybe collage and assemblage of... Uh, the way social behavior uh, it's been represented in existing modes, if that makes sense. I don't think it's exclusively what I do, but, but I would say it's definitely something that I use. Yeah. And, and would you say that this constant... And, flat, and sorry, and the yeah. flattening of it, you know, the both flattening. formally, yeah, both formally, and also if you think about conceptually, you know, if I use uh, different characters of photos, you know, I do something that someone told me is quite violent, you know, I use uh, photographs of people's faces or animals, different genders, different animals and so on, and use them equally, yeah. you know, I organize them. Uh, in a composition and I like I said before I really look at it and even in the time-based piece like that I really look at them as you know formal elements that I play with um, so maybe it has you know, violence in it I don't know I think I'm quite nice to them but um, but it's a real tool you know it's a real tool like to use you know gays and, and people and, and, and what I do with these videos and maybe over time in general in different shows I, I look at you know I look at the practice it's not, you know, like this show and that's it, or like then I'm on to the next thing. You know, I'm doing this and I'm already thinking about the next chapter with those guys, perhaps. Sometimes, you know, I edit some people out and in. Same way I edit, you know, like mark making out and in. Um, but I'm thinking about the next one, you know? Yeah. yeah. And like, would you, would you say that it's constant pointing out at the conventions of representation, behaviors, or the conventions of staging and everything, would you say that like your work also has a sort of a political concern for emancipating the viewer from the rules uh, of yes or no it's more maybe like maybe myself or is right? more kind of a more like intimate need to reprocess constantly the way that we i think it's both i think it's like a lack of quietness in general in terms of um both in terms of time and how i manage myself in this world but also my lack of satisfaction with what i can produce from it with what i have you know my limitations, my limitations within different languages. I'm not only talking about English or, or what have you, any language that I speak or don't. Um, I definitely not try to, you know, like educate or like try to tell everyone, you know, like we should find ways to, but I try to find ways to represent and by doing, you know, problems and ideas, but, and by doing that, obviously I touch upon things that I see as problems or limitations. And like I said before, you know, like I was very literal about it, you know, like the voice that tells us to do this or the limitation of the space. But, you know, I'm charmed or have problems with the way they're being represented. For instance, like what I said before about like how kids organize their table or their room and so on, or I organize or disorganize my studio, or um, things that I find more problematic, like this book, uh, where the author and this obviously like a um, 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 uh, uh, persona of authority and knowledge, um, called a 16 year old student the creature so the whole text is like I the creature the creature I and the beginning of the text is like please help me so you know it starts like that I become a bit angry I try to read more I write something on it then it becomes something that you know can is a beginning of it's a problem you know it's a seed uh, from there you know I basically become a bit more brutal yeah so there is this thing also 
there is this theme of learning, teaching, instructing, like the, the structures that we use to learn how to exist in the world. Absolutely, but you know, again, I'm not trying to, um, you know, the work is political in that sense, yeah. I would say, you know, but again, socially political. Um, but these are not, you know, suggestions for alternatives. This is my, perhaps, idiosyncratic way of representing those things the way they, they, they come out of me. Yeah, the way that yeah. we exist. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm reading this book wrong. Yeah. You know, not that I think there's a way to really try it or wrong, but I'm definitely not reading it to like be a better method actor. So, you know. Now, there is one last question that I will ask you, and then I would like to invite the audience to ask questions as well. But uh, going back to the paintings and this constant um, presence of marks, traces, um, layers, um, and if you go and look at the sculptures and the vitrines, there is, I would say, again, a lot of traces, but a lot of dirt in a way. Like, I mean, things they, I wouldn't say that they look, you know, old or used, but like they have a lot of old and time. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of time in them. And um, um, there is this like presence of what we call the object in a way. I mean, something, mm -hmm. I w we were talking before about this, there is this novel of um, Philip Roth, The Human Stain, and um, which is a story of uh, guilt or perceived guilt, of accusation. And, and, and the, the, the author at one point says, like, uh, as a human being, it doesn't matter what we do, we leave a stain, whatever we do. We like, basically because we exist uh, on a biological level, so if I touch this piece of paper, I leave a mark, I leave a stain. I, so whatever we do, we leave a stain. And the stain, or the trace, uh, is really present in your work. Could be formal, could be existential understanding, lexical understanding of it. But there is a very central, um, we talked about before, about the the, the education in printmaking, and of course, it has to do with leaving a mark, but also like the process of accumulation of layers in the painting yeah. or the accumulation of layers in the editing. Yeah. So, I don't even know if this is a question, but I think that this is like a, a, a very important aspect of your work, which could be interesting to explore because it can be a formal understanding of yeah. the trace, but a more existential understanding of the trace. Yeah, so you know, like taking a step back, yeah. like starting maybe from the, not so much with the formal, you know, it's like comic struggle of self-understanding, you know, yeah. which is abject, you know, it's like in some ways, right? So, and, and using different ways to try to present that, you know, and again, not necessarily, you know, like subscribed, what, will, what is it that like my practice is about, you know, like, you know, existentialism, <coughs> I'm not sure, but, but you know, those things come out. And, and more formally speaking, I would say that maybe it's a attraction to sort of natural gravitation and maybe my education as a typographer, you know, I've spent many years sort of, you know, like copying letters and like thinking about negative and positive and positive spaces and, and text and the meanings of text, but also, like we said before, sort of the, the, the visual qualities of it. The visual, yeah. And when they yeah. become more abstract as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, <coughs> So different range of mark making, yeah. Um, and what does it mean, really, you know, to leave a mark? You know. Yeah. So again, going back to the object, but I don't want to sound too, uh, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, smoky and drunk here. But yeah, because it's not, uh, it's not what I am. I think. And um, but, 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 yeah, you know, it's a, it's a. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be as a romantic or simplistic as saying, you know, it's a reflection of like, you know, your identity. Not at all. I would say something more. Um, Maybe reducing it a bit into again this diaristic um, uh, situation, you know. I was here, or so on. That's something through history, right? From like yeah. uh, the hand mark. But 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 with this again, going back to what I said before, using those marks uh, strategically, mm -hmm. knowing that they have this history, knowing that they have this um, not only history but they have personal history. We talked about the video before that um, that has to do with this the voiceover and the dancers. That's it. There's something very personal about that video. And many times with the, with the photographs, the collages, the paintings, and the video, people ask me, like, who is it in the videos, you know? And it's not always because of my twin brother, which, by the way, is not like something I usually put out in public, as public knowledge. It just became, he's in so many videos at this point, he's such a collaborator, that people ask me. But people do ask me what's my relationship to the people I work with, and the imagery. 
and I find that question, they ask me if they're my family or you know, friends, and I find that question more important and interesting than the actual answer. The fact that there is a sense or the notion of a, of a personal history to them is for me not a success, but that's what I want. You know, to create these projections or assumptions um, about a piece of paper that, you know, like s somebody can say, like, you know, it serves as a document or a personal document or something that's charged with, uh, with, uh, with emotions. So, yeah. I don't know if that really answered the question. No, I think it's not. The, I also like, I know, don't even I know if it was a question, but I think it's such a important, this aspect um, of the, the big, also because, of course, I mean, like the, in the paintings and in the drawings, of course, something that appears to be so instinctive, it's actually like really choreographed and like really... It has to do also with, you know, categorization and classification, yeah. you know? It's almost like, you know, very attracted and I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people find it interesting. Even some of the images we see here, you know, with his workshops and so on, but, you know, footprints, you know? It helps us categorize and move things and organize things, you know, through differences and different negative and positive spaces to understand what's what as a decision and organizing body or power about who's who and where is where through visuals which we find for some reason at times really attractive. So that's also something I'm really interested in, like how come those things are so sort of almost instinctively attractive or like that I want to work with them but at the same time, you know, not to be too structuralist about it, but you know, we push them into categories, yeah. you know. I mean, that's, I'm not against science here, but, <laughs> yeah, but it is interesting. Uh, I think that at this point we should um, invite the audience to ask questions if you have any for Uri because we're almost running out of time. Why can I ask you? Yeah. <coughs> I have not seen your show. Hi, I'm Eva. I've not seen Hello. your show and if I would go there tomorrow and you would have to say one emotion which you would wish that you would evoke in me, which one would that be? Yeah, nice question. Uh, wow, I can give a very romantic... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but first of all, like I said before, maybe the, the, this question, if this comes up at all, you know, the idea of emotions in there, again, without making a cartoon image, you know, of sentimentality or human emotions in general, that's already good, you know, thinking about this idea of representing that, and it's something that many artists, and I would say in general in popular culture, will avoid, you know, trying to touch sentiment and sort of, you know, and maybe I sort of have some leverage because, you know, like my work sometimes is perceived as cerebral or, you know, I'm just, or I can show like, you know, great galleries and great institutions, you know, so you sort of, I have the freedom to experiment in that. But, and, but that I would do that also if I would work, or when I was like, you know, working construction or bartending, I still did the same thing. This is something that happens despite myself, right? But um, that's what I do, and um, but I don't know. It would be joy. <laughs> is, that, is that an emotion? <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, it really sounds. I don't know. Yeah, but I wouldn't direct you into any of them. Maybe, 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 maybe through like small nudges of manipulation in the different videos, <laughs> or like looking at a painting and listening to you know like li looking at many different things, deciding what is it that you focus on, you know, within this map, right? if it's interesting enough for you, taking that time. You know, it's, it's not an easy show in that sense, you know? I mean, I think it's easy, but at the same time that I, you know, I get assume that something that takes me like a long time to make, and I'm not talking about like one drawing or one painting or one video, but something that takes so long to compose, and even one thing, you know, an age, and negotiate the relationship to an object, or like you say, the sort of surplus from that object, or my relationship to it, I can only expect that it would take some sort of uh, exhale for a second to understand which is it that you're focusing on and how you feel about it, you know, if you care to, you know, but it's almost like take a step to the left, count to ten, you know, and engage, but, but, but yeah, maybe it's like, it's like not true. it's interesting, you know, I see, I'm really interesting, in, I'm sorry, this is a long, long answer, but I'm interested in the, the, the routes people take, you know, in installation, where they start to begin and where they start to end, in that sense it has to do again with like, you know, structures of language or narrative, right, or time-based, you know, you'll see there's a lot of sort of like uh, repetition, but also seriousness, more like rhythms, you know, different rhythms in this space. And I think, you know, if you stand a bit, you know, in the northern side of the gallery and you look at a painting, you'll be forced, if, again, if you're open to it, 
to listen to a certain kind of uh, text or music or a few musics, right? Our melodies while you look at something. So in a way it will paint your experience in a certain way or like push you towards it and you can be resistant towards it or accept it and develop something. And at a different point you'll hear something completely different while looking at the same painting or a different one. So yeah, I think this combination or collage, like you, like you mentioned before, and the flattening of, uh, of it to a time-based moment um, creates this other kind of collage, right? Wow, okay. <laughs> I don't mean to say, it's only also... It's just what it is. It's, it's I don't really know if it's a question or an observation, and it seems very particularly related to the conversation between the two of you. I was reading an essay a couple of weeks ago by um, Alberto Eco, and he's about the relationships between uh, Italian language, post Dante, uh, poetic Italian, and modern Hebrew, and looking at non-nomenclature. Um, or well, never meant, uh, I can't think of it in Latin, excuse me. But he was expressing the idea that the foundation of language comes through isom isomorphic relationships of forms, which is a mathematical form that has the same target and um, uh, intention. So if in language you say a rabbit is, has an iso isomorphic relationship to a tree, that language can decide that a rabbit and a tree are the same thing. And um, reading this, I, told, I thought, this is just the most beautiful description of Uri's work. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, what your language does is create isomorphic relationships between the things that you depict and the things that you think. So it's essentially thought made evident. And I was just looking to see if I'm on the right track. No, that's, <laughs> that's beautiful. Yeah, no, first of all, it sounds really nice, very poetic, and, 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 and you know, of course, I'm not as knowledgeable as you are about, about some of the things you're talking about, but but, I'm not, uh, but it's no, 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 it's, it's, but but it definitely makes sense. And you know, like if if I will sort of like drop some reading material here to be, you know, like maybe the order of things by Foucault, mm -hmm. which has a specific, you know, like chapter that talks about um, um, classification. There's like I, I, I don't want to be in this misquoting here, but he basically speaks about, you know, the Chinese uh, method of the emperor of, you know, like things that are categorizing together. And it's basically a list of animals of things which are pretty amazing in terms of like how we decide what's logical to put together in different groups. Yeah. So, so, and it really relates to what you just said. You know, so. but, but I, I gather Dante wrote in the like late, late 13th century um, a text called Volcara uh, Sereclenta where he talked about the, the idea of naming things, nomenclature, um, as almost like a Michelangelo idea of carving something from a block of marble, that to find the name of something, you stripped away all the things to find what that name always was. And that's how names of, you know, dog yeah. arise, because it was, uh, and it has a commonality in all languages from Chinese to, to French to German to That's the building blocks of the relationship with the universal language. Well, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not as, you know, I'm not as, um, I'm sure not as well read and, uh, as you are, and some of those references that, you know, I take from you uh, right now, so I take it as you just presented it. But I would say the beautiful thing about it is, you know, basically individuality, you know, and sort of like how we see things, and sorry, this is really like... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, definitely relevant. You know, projections, you know, associations, mm -hmm. and so on, and, uh, and obviously language, you know, language barriers, and then and, and participating in language. Can I suggest that this is what you know, so many people say to us that, um, or oh, I love Rory's work, I don't understand why I love it, but I love it. And I think that's. They're on the right track. Exactly. <laughs> that's that perfect isomorphic relationship between what you do, that people understand your language without understanding it because of projection of your intention through mm -hmm. is so incredibly, excuse my French, but clear, um, yes. Um, well, as clear as anything else, you see what I mean? I find like so many of us, you know, as artists, and I'm not even talking about like in different, you know, di different um, concentrations of, of, uh, of art. It doesn't necessarily, some, I mean, for me, the differences between, um, of course, you know, there's, there's a discourse in education, there's a common language, and there's a common denominator in all of us. 
specifically, you know, like if we went to the same art school or to art school in general and so on. But I find, you know, that two painters or two video artists can be, one can be a cobbler, the other one can be a doctor, and the third one can be a veterinarian. And that's what's so amazing about it in that sense. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting to reduce my, uh, my answers into to sort of um, something that doesn't sound that smart. But, but I really see it that way, and that's so beautiful about it. But why I'm saying it, because like a lot of things that might be obvious, I don't see what's uh, super obvious about a specific drawing or a specific painting. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm sort of like preaching to the choir here because everyone's here for a reason today. But, but, but of course, we take for granted, you know, the culture. Um, for instance, the relationship uh, or the hierarchy between uh, different mediums in art making. And within that, you know, the history of it, you know, and what's important and what's not. But mostly what's interesting to me is what's obvious to us. What can we read? You know, what can we analyze and what we can't? So like you said, maybe someone can be interested in my art but not necessarily understand it. I find it is like um, hard to read or easy to read is something that might be, I don't want to give examples, but I'm not to say the Mona Lisa, but you know, and like, and obviously, you know, I'm humbled, yeah, but, but, um, but yeah, as, a, as, as a, someone else's painting or someone else's drawing, of course, it's very personal, yeah, but, but, but the sort of like cultural decisions about it has to do with practice and time. Practice and time, and of course, you know, power and manipulation and so on. But, Yeah, please, if I can answer it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just wondering, so if you're using musicians as actors... I'm sorry, are, please. When, when you use musicians as actors, what are your observations about the differences in their acting to, say, actors acting or other people acting? And you kind of were talking about, you know, your attentiveness to maybe rhythm or each other that comes from yeah. perhaps like having to improvise together. Like, how does it come across in the acting, in your acting? Uh, I think... Um, Maybe using people that uh, used to work together a lot and be on the road together a lot and also incorporating that sort of the romantic aspect of that, the way I see it, and their, you know, their, their life. You know, these, these are guys that work at night. You know, I mean, they might be teaching or like, uh, I don't know, making lunch in the morning but, um, or making breakfast and lunch, but um, they work at night. And that's part of the language, you know, as people, I would say. And they practice it. Uh, that's one thing, but more specifically in terms of how they work together and formally also, they complete each other, they work, you know, the discords and the harmonies work in a musical way. That's what I said before when I was talking about, you know, an operatic relationship. It helps me to define characters uh, when I have uh, two or three or four or five, if I work like with a bigger ensemble of people that are trained with working with other people, reading each other with nuances. You know, so those guys, if you will see in the video, if you saw it, you know, they react to each other on um, very nuanced based uh, kind of behavior, musical really, you know, the same way that dancers might, or maybe trained actors. So I don't really work with trained actors, so I don't really know the difference, but something about it for me is almost a decision, you know, like don't, you don't have to start, you know, I see people that I think are good actors. You know, I know that my brother, which is, you know, funny enough, almost 100% DNA, or we started 100% DNA identical, and it's sort of like, to the part, he got the acting part, you know, like, or, or, or feeling natural, or, 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 or being less patient in a good way, in a way that serves me. Um, and also, I try to learn them, you know, I know what one guy can give me, what the other, you know, one of them is not allowed to speak in most of the video, you know, in most of this um, series. But he speaks so much more in other ways than the other guy. So the other guy, you know, does his other thing, you know, so, and that's what I'm saying also about genres as well. I try to like, you know, use them as a mechanism of quotation um, um, through what they can give me, you know. And uh, they're performers, you know, like in the real sense, you know, they're like, we've all been in New York for like, you know, about 20 years and, and that's the, the way they live. Um, so I try to take that sort of, um, again, quotation or romantic notion into what I'm trying to get out of them. Mm, did I answer this right? Yeah. yeah. Good. So, like, um, uh, yeah, I would like to thank like Uri for this really, really inspiring talk, and to all of you for coming. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.